Good afternoon. Welcome to this second class in the Brexit A Crash course. I'm Dr Tim Oliver. What we're going to do today is look at the EU referendum itself, the actual campaign, um, the actual renegotiation before it, and the result and how the British people voted. This is therefore the second of two classes. Next week we'll look at the future in terms of where the UK-EU relationship goes now, where the UK goes and where the EU goes and so forth, and where the Brexit negotiations and how they will unfold. And last week, of course, we looked at Britain and the EU history. And this week, we'll look at the actual campaign, how the campaign unfolded, why David Cameron called a referendum, what happened on the day in terms of what we now know or what we can say we know with some um, certainty about how the British people voted and what were the most immediate outcomes of the vote on the 23rd of June. But very quickly, let's just recap um, with what we talked about last week in terms of the history of Brexit. First of all, why study Brexit? One point that was made to me over the weekend um, when I was back in London and talking about European politics and um, British EU relations and the future of the transatlantic relationship was that you don't often see a country vote to make such a radical or potentially such a radical change as Brexit might bring about in terms of its unity, identity, place in the world, its position in Europe and its knock-on effects within Europe. You see these type of events usually occur in terms of revolutions, in terms of defeats and major political changes, major critical junctures almost um, within countries' histories and developments. And Brexit might be one of those. It's still too early to say whether it definitely will but it's not very often that you see a country's people vote for this type of degree of change. So that's one extra reason to study Brexit. In addition to those we talked about last week in terms of looking at a country that's a good example of Europeanisation, of globalisation, of the security challenges countries face, of looking at a country that's very committed to European integration in some respects, but also a very difficult member um, when it comes to European integration. We looked at why um, Britain has had trouble connecting to some of the founding ideas of European integration, especially when it comes to security, that from a British historical perspective, from the British psyche, if you want to call it that, the idea of joining with countries such as France and Germany immediately after the Second World War did not make either emotional or political or security or economic sense that Britain had been the last holdout during the Second World War, at the height of the Second World War, when Britain pretty much stood on its own in a European context. Britain had been isolated, and therefore it made no sense to now commit um, to joining with these countries and possibly endangering the position of Britain to do that in future. That meant that Britain had something of an awkward relationship with the European Union from the start. It joined late um, so therefore the European Union was already set up in a way which it didn't feel very comfortable with. It had to get in at any cost and then try to renegotiate membership of the European Union from the inside. That caused tensions from the beginning, but Britain isn't the only country to have joined late. Nevertheless, its historical experiences, its different political culture, tensions between France, Germany and Britain have meant that Britain has sometimes been an awkward partner. But notice the and there. Notice that it's, in, it's the indefinite article. Stephen George, who, termed, who coined the term an awkward partner for a book he wrote in 1990, did not call the book the awkward partner. Britain is not the only country in the European Union to be awkward. Lots of countries can be awkward. And then you can compare that with the idea that Britain has actually been a very quiet European very constructive and engaging country when it comes to European integration. That actually, when you step back and you look at Britain's contributions to the European Union, Britain has actually been at the forefront of many areas of EU development. That can be contested in some areas, but nevertheless it contrasts with that awkward partner mentality or uh, narrative that's sometimes put forward. Nevertheless, Europe has been deeply divisive in British politics. It has destroyed prime ministers. It has divided parties. It split the Labour Party. Why? Because Europe finds itself or works its way into almost every aspect of British political um, discourse, um, whether it's about identity politics, whether it's political economy, security, the future of the Union, um, or constitutional matters and so forth. So it works its way in. It's not just about left-right, it's about liberal or authoritarian, it's about global as opposed to European, it's about English and Scottish identities and so forth. So it's been exceptionally divisive. Uh, okay, so what we'll do today is we'll look at, first of all, why David Cameron called a referendum, 
on this issue. If it was so divisive, why hasn't there been one before? And why was it that David Cameron decided to call this vote? Then we'll look at ha what happened in the renegotiation, because David Cameron essentially didn't just say we want to have a referendum about Britain's membership of the European Union, we want to have a renegotiated relationship that will then be put to the British people in a referendum. So what happened in that renegotiation? We'll then look at how the campaign actually unfolded, what happened day by day. I won't go through a narrative in terms of day by day and so forth, but we'll then look at how the British people voted, um, or at least what we can say we know about how the British people voted. We can then look at why the Leave campaign won, and then look briefly at what some of the immediate implications were, and next week I'll talk along uh, for uh, talk in more detail about what those implications are turning into in terms of the Brexit negotiations that are now unfolding. So, first of all, why then did David Cameron commit to holding an EU referendum? Here is David Cameron back in January 2013 at Bloomberg's headquarters in London, in which he gave a speech in which he had committed the Conservative Party, and it's important to remember it was the Conservative Party, not the British government. He was Prime Minister, but he was Prime Minister of a coalition government with the Liberal Democrats, and he was not in a position, because of that coalition, to commit to a referendum there and then. But he committed the Conservative Party to seeking a renegotiated relationship between the UK and the EU, which would then be put to the British people in an in-out referendum. That would be if he won the next general election, which at the time was still scheduled for May 2015, and which obviously eventually did come to pass. So why did he call this? Why in January 2013 did the Prime Minister, David Cameron, decide, I need to give a big speech, and I need to commit my party to holding an in-out referendum? Well, there are several reasons. First, there were internal tensions within the Conservative Party that dated back almost 20, some say 30, 40 years. Mrs Thatcher had been brought down by the issue of Europe. John Major's government had been plagued by the issue of Europe. Even the Conservatives back in the early 1980s and the 1970s had never been entirely united on the issue of, um, of, of Europe. The issue had become one of the most divisive issues within the Conservative Party. It became a defining question for all Conservative Party or Conservative candidates for, um, for becoming an MP, that the local parties would often ask them, how would you vote in an in-out referendum? And a large number of local parties would only choose a candidate who said, I would vote to leave the European Union. There may have been some caveats there by saying, I, I try to renegotiate Britain's membership and so forth. But the general trend within the Conservative Party had been towards Euroscepticism for a long time. The leadership of the Conservative Party had coped with, but not confronted this. For almost 20 years, the Conservative Party had tried to kick the can down the road of trying to avoid confronting the Euroscepticism that had been growing within it. David Cameron had tried to negotiate with the Eurosceptic right within his party when he'd become leader. In fact, he'd become leader in part because he'd committed himself to withdrawing the Conservative Party from what was called the European People's Party, which was the Conservative Christian Democrat grouping within the European Parliament that brought together Christian Democrats and kind of parties on the right um, in European politics together within the European Union. And he committed himself um, to withdrawing the Conservative Party from the EPP if he became leader. And that was one of the things that won him the leadership because the EPP was seen as a, very, as a grouping of political parties that were too committed to a federal Europe and a United States of Europe and European integration and therefore something the Conservative Party's membership and a large number of its MPs did not feel comfortable with. But in doing that, he therefore, as Kenneth Clark, a very pro-European Conservative MP and former minister, had said you know, he'd thrown a bum to the, to, the, to the alligator of the Eurosceptic right, but then he kept on throwing bums to try and keep on feeding this and appeasing it. So he committed himself to a review of Britain's relationship with the European Union. He committed himself to holding a referendum on what was the Lisbon Treaty, which he couldn't deliver on eventually. He committed himself eventually to holding an in-out referendum. He kept on doing this almost to try and buy himself time because the Conservative government, when it got into power in 2010 with the, with the Liberal Democrats, it was a Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition, could be described, could, um, as a coalition of three parties. You had the Liberal Democrats, who made up about 58 MPs, and then you had the Conservative Party, split into two. You had the right wing of the Conservative Party, which would tend to be more Eurosceptic, tended to want to Britain to leave the European Union, and you had a more moderate 
let's say, one nation conservatism led by David Cameron. And in that situation, David Cameron was trying to buy off the right of his Conservative Party. And that's one of the reasons he gave this commitment in 2013, that he was essentially saying to them, give me more time, don't worry, I will get round to this, we will hold a referendum on Britain's membership of the European Union. Why had the right wing of the Conservative Party become more and more agitated about the issue of Europe? One reason, but not the only reason, was the rise of the UK Independence Party and a fear among some Conservatives that UKIP was essentially going to try and overtake the Conservative Party or take away a large number of its votes and therefore deprive it of a majority of the general election. To some extent, that fear was genuine, but in other areas it was exaggerated. However, it is very important not to assume that it was just the Conservative Party that had become obsessed with the issue of Europe and worked itself into a position where it had become committed to an in-out referendum. All of the UK's main political parties went into the 2015 general election committed in some way to holding an in-out referendum. The Labour Party had been split over the issue um, for almost a generation. That split had been kind of managed better in the 19, late 1980s and 1990s under Tony Blair, for example, but the party had split in the early 1980s and there remained a large degree of discontent on the left of the Labour Party and unease at this liberal, neoliberal capitalist project that is the European Union from their perspective, whereas on the right there were people who were more comfortable with, with, with European integration, but aware that UKIP was snapping at the Labour Party's heels as well, that UKIP was taking a large number of Labour-supporting um, voters in places like the North East and so forth. So the Labour Party was also committed, in some way, to holding a referendum. The Liberal Democrats, the most pro-European of the three-slash-four we should, suppose we should say four now because of UKIP, um, mainstream political parties, um, was the first of the parties <coughs> to commit to an in-out referendum. And they did so under the leadership of Nick Clegg, who himself is a very committed pro-European, a former MEP, speaks numerous European languages, and is a committed pro-Europeanist. But he did this because his party found itself in hot water and, and split over the issue of what to do about the Lisbon Treaty. When the Lisbon Treaty was put before the British Parliament for voting, to, 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 to vanify. Nick Clegg essentially wanted to support the Lisbon Treaty, but didn't want to support a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty out of fear that essentially voting, allowing the Lisbon Treaty to be put before the British people would allow the British people to reject it, and they didn't want that. So, as a compromise, the Liberal Democrats decided to back the idea of having an in-out referendum. And to some extent, there's a certain logic to this, because all parties had used the issue of having a referendum on the Euro, a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, and so forth, as a kind of a proxy for an in-out referendum. And it was the Liberal Democrats who were the first to try and break this by saying, well, actually, let's just have an in-out referendum. So by the time of the 2015 election, having a referendum had become a norm in British politics on the EU question. Referendums had also become pretty much a norm in UK politics anyway, whether it was with regard to Scotland, in terms of the devolution of power to Scotland, whether it had been referendums on setting up a mayor of London, um, referendums have become far more accepted. Back in 1975, when Britain held a referendum on its membership of, or continued membership of the European Economic Community, it was the first time Britain had ever held a, a national referendum. It was something that was seen as deeply um, against the grain of British parliamentary politics. But by 2015, pretty much everyone was committed to the idea of holding a referendum in some way. However, it's important to note that in the UK, um, UK constitutional setup, a referendum is pretty much in the gift of the Prime Minister and Her Majesty's Government, HMG. It is a political tool. When a referendum is called in the UK, it pretty much depends on whether the Prime Minister and the Cabinet are prepared to go for it. There's no neutral constitutional requirement that you will hold a referendum if certain things happen. There's no constitutional requirement set down by a Supreme Court. It's pretty much down to at the decision of the Prime Minister and the government of the day. Therefore, it's a political tool. They get to decide on the timing, largely. They get to decide on the question. They get to frame what it's actually going to be about. A good example of this is that the question eventually was, do you wish to remain or leave, a mem uh, leave the European Union? It was never going to be a question about, do you want to commit to further European integration or try and break down Britain's membership of the European Union into terms of different kind of variations of membership, um, including leave or more integration? It was always going to be remain or leave, and that was pretty much the choice of the Prime Minister and the government himself. One reason that Cameron 
and many thought that a renegotiation or a referendum would be helpful, was that they thought it would be cathartic. They thought if we could get this over with, if we could have a vote, if we could have this debate, we'll be able to put this behind us and move on to more important issues. This was one reason that Sir John Major, the former Prime Minister, backed Cameron in his idea of holding a referendum. To some extent that makes sense, um, however, whether or not you could simplify an issue like Europe down to the complexities um, of, uh, sorry, a complex issue like Europe down to the simplicity of an in-out referendum is another matter, but nevertheless people thought that maybe we could have a cathartic moment if we sought the consent of the British people and we've kept on promising them referendums. We promised them a referendum on the Euro, we promised them referendums on different treaties, and they never delivered, they never actually delivered on doing this. They would just use these commitments were used by leaders, including in the Labour Party, in the Liberal Democrats, and within the Conservative Party, to buy off internal dissent within those parties. And that eventually raised questions of credibility. The British people were sick of being told, you will be given a referendum. Honestly, we will give you one eventually. So as I said, eventually by 2015, this had pretty much run its course and everybody accepted that there would at some point be a referendum in some way. David Cameron therefore found himself after the 2015 election in a bit of a quandary. He committed himself to having a referendum and a renegotiation, <coughs> possibly not expecting to actually have to deliver that because really nobody expected him to win a majority in 2015. The result itself pretty much overturned some of the laws of British politics, which is that a, a government that's a minority doesn't, doesn't win an election in terms of taking a majority. So perhaps he didn't expect to actually have to deliver on this. In the end, he did. Um, he actually had to try and renegotiate Britain's relationship with the European Union and then put the vote to the, and then put the issue to the British people. So the first thing he had to do was seek a renegotiated relationship with the rest of the EU. Well, first of all, why seek a renegotiation with the EU? What did Cameron actually want in this situation? First of all, he did it for tactical reasons. In 1975, um, when Britain had held a referendum on its continued membership of the European Economic Community, Harold Wilson, the Prime Minister then, had gone off to Germany and to France and to Brussels and so forth and sought a renegotiated relationship of Britain's very recent membership of the European Economic Community. And history told Cameron, and the pollsters also told Cameron, that if you can secure a renegotiated relationship that you can then put to the British people, they'll likely vote for it because they want to, something to change. And if you can bring a change to them and say, here we are, I'm happy with this, we've got a renegotiated relationship, like Harold Wilson did in 1975, even if it doesn't actually mean that much, like it did in 1975, where it was a bit of a kind of, um, a bit of a, bit of a show, a bit of um, uh, kind of smoke and mirrors to some extent, even if that's the case, the British people will still be more likely to vote Remain if they know that something has changed. So he did it for tactical reasons. It's kind of made sense. He also did this within the Conservative Party to give a lot of his Conservative Eurosceptic MPs who were sceptical about Britain's membership of the European Union but didn't want to see Britain leave the European Union, give them a reason to say, look, we've renegotiated our relationship. So they could go back to their constituencies, they could go back to their local parties and say, look, we have a renegotiated relationship we can back Britain remaining in the European Union now. It also bought him time in which um, to try and decide when to call a referendum. As I said, it's pretty much in the Prime Minister's gift to try and decide on the timing. Therefore, a renegotiation, if it could take several, a certain amount of time, would give him a certain you know, leeway in terms of when he would actually call that, um, that referendum. It was also a reflection, to be fair, on him, wasn't just done for internal Conservative Party reasons, it was also done because the European Union and the UK are changing in terms of their relations with one another. There were genuine concerns about Britain's position within the European Union where the Eurozone was now becoming the heart and the decision-making heart of the European Union. What would that mean for a country like Britain and the City of London and so forth if they were going to find themselves excluded from the Eurozone's decision-making? So there was a genuine concern here that the UK was going to lose out from a changing EU. So we needed to change our relationship at some point with the European Union. So what did Cameron actually want? Well, unfortunately for the Prime Minister at the time, his options were quite limited. Limited in one sense in that the British government under the, con the coalition government of 2010 to 2015 had carried out something called a balance of competences review, which isn't something that 
when you hear the name Balance of Competences Review, immediately tells you what it is. But this was essentially a review of the EU's powers in British politics and British life, and the balance of powers between the UK and the EU, between a member state and the European Union. So this was a review of the balance of, of kind of competences, or balance of powers, between the member state of the UK, UK and the European Union. And this was the first time that a member state had ever really done this in the most comprehensive way possible. And it had been done under the coalition government, again by David Cameron, essentially trying to assuage some of the rights on his Conservative Party to say, look, we're going to carry out this big review that's going to identify the areas where the European Union has too many powers, where Britain is losing out, and that will inform us in terms of seeking a renegotiated relationship or tell us what we need to do if we want to leave the European Union. So this review was carried out. At first, the rest of the European Union wouldn't want to touch this. They thought this was just going to be a European Union bashing exercise. But as the months and the years rolled by and the review was carried out by the British Civil Service, actually what they found was that the balance was actually about right. There was an incredible huge amount of data gathered, huge amount of evidence gathered from academics, from business, from charities, from other governments around the world in terms of what they thought about the balance of powers between the UK and the EU. And yes, they did identify areas where there, were, there was potential for reform. But the overall conclusion of this balance of competences review was actually the balance is kind of about right. Eurosceptics attacked this as a whitewash. They thought it was nonsense. They thought this was ridiculous. Um, they thought this was outrageous, that it was actually a kind of a stitch up by the, um, the Liberal Democrats and those within the Conservative Party were more pro-European. Okay, there is that case to be put, but at the same time, the British government and the British Civil Service were tasked to carry out this exercise, and now you have this huge amount of evidence that told us, actually, the balance is just about right. There's nothing really that needs to radically change. So when David Cameron turns around to the rest of the European Union after the 2015 election and says, I would like to renegotiate our relationship, the rest of the EU, having not wanted to touch this balance of competences review, now picks it up and says, but your balance of competences review tells us and tells you that actually things are about right, so what on earth do you want to renegotiate? Nevertheless, Cameron did seek some changes, because the balance of competences review, as you can probably imagine, was quickly buried and forgotten about, and gathering dust now on kind of um, university shelves and in the archives. What did Cameron want? Well, he wanted several things. One of the most prominent things was that he wanted restrictions on free movement. He wanted restrictions in terms of access to benefits for EU migrants coming to the UK. He wanted to ensure there was non-discrimination against the United Kingdom within the Eurozone. He did that because of a concern that the City of London's interests were essentially going to be squashed by the Eurozone's interests. And essentially Britain was going to be outvoted by this caucusing of the rest of the Eurozone against the non-Eurozone uh, non members of the EU, especially the United Kingdom. So he wanted protection against that. He wanted to make sure that Britain was not going to be discriminated against. He wanted a commitment by the European Union for more competitiveness and enterprise and free market, um, free market liberal economics within the European Union. He wanted a bigger role for national parliaments in the European Union's decision making. He wanted to make sure that national parliaments could stand up and say, we're not happy with this, so we could hold up a red card or an orange card or even give a green card, for example, on EU legislation and EU policy. So national parliaments, the real heart of democracy in Europe, could actually give their consent to certain EU um, decisions. He wanted Britain to be exempted from some of the commitments to ever closer union and European integration. He wasn't comfortable with Britain's commitment to this in terms of what the European Union was aiming towards. And as I said, the big thing, however, that he wanted was really something on immigration restrictions. And what did he get? Well, first of all, he did get some restrictions in terms of benefit access for EU migrants coming to the UK. He was able to apply, um, negotiate a break on this. He was, surprise, surprise, able to secure a commitment to greater competition and enterprise within the European Union, but hey, that's pretty much standard jargon within the EU at the moment. He was able to secure some safeguards um, for the City of London and for the UK against being caucused against by the Eurozone. He was able to secure a more prominent role for national parliaments in terms of being able to apply a red card system to say no to certain EU laws. He was able to secure an exemption for Britain from the term ever closer union. So there was something to kind of, that was going to be essentially written in at some point saying, 
Well, the rest of the European Union might be committed to ever closer union among the peoples of Europe, but Britain isn't. Britain doesn't have to take part in this. The one thing that overhung all this, and the question that um, badgered him all the way through the renegotiation and afterwards, was whether or not this was legally binding, whether or not what the European Union had offered in terms of a renegotiation was actually going to be um, lived up to at some point in the future, and whether Cameron needed a treaty change to get this renegotiation fixed. There's one thing that the rest of the European Union is, is in no mood to do right now, and that's reopen the treaty um, change Pandora's box. So Cameron was given this renegotiation and assured, yes, it will be legally binding, yes, we will write it into a treaty if needs be at a later date, but this is set. And to some extent, what he secured wasn't, you know, it wasn't insignificant. Um, nevertheless, it wasn't the negotiation, the renegotiation that he wanted. One of the reasons that he called it slightly wrong was because when in 2013 he committed himself to seeking a renegotiated relationship, he had thought, looking forward, that at some point around 2016, 2015, 16, 17, <coughs> around the time that he thought maybe he might have to carry out this renegotiation, that the European Union would be having a new treaty and that the rest of the European Union would be in the mood to renegotiate the UK-EU relationship as part of a bigger overall renegotiation of the European Union setup. Unfortunately for the Prime Minister, that was too early. He may have been about five, maybe six years too early in trying to get this. It's still possible that a treaty change will happen in the next few years, at which point we'll see people debating, well, actually, this is the time at which Britain could have secured the renegotiation it wanted, especially over free movement. So Cameron tried to do something too soon, but he was in no position to try and do anything else. He committed himself to this, so he had to kind of go through with it. He kind of painted himself into a corner. How did the rest of the EU view the deal? Well, a lot of them were very angry and frustrated at having to negotiate this. They didn't see why they should have to put up so much effort into this. There was a certain degree of Britain is crying wolf again in terms of threatening to leave the European Union. As we talked about last week, Britain can sometimes be seen as the spoilt child of the European Union. It's kind of, okay, Britain wants something again. <coughs> why do we keep on buying it off? Why can't we just say no um, to the UK and just get it over and done with and make it kind of, you know, kind of stay or go? And then finally, how did it go down in the UK? Well, it bought, Prime, it bought the Prime Ministers with some time. People within the Conservative Party, especially Conservative MPs, were prepared to give him time to negotiate this and were not prepared to commit themselves to either backing Remain or leave until he actually came back with a renegotiated relationship and actually showed them what he had. Some, however, were very sceptical right from the start. They knew that the European Union was in no position to grant him the significant renegotiation that he wanted. So how did it go down in the UK? Well, when he brought it back, some within the Conservative Party were very immediately very dismissive. The press was immediately dismissive. And so where did this go in the, re in the actual campaign? After all this effort, after all this time, after hours, especially into the small hours in the European Council meeting negotiating this, what happened when the referendum campaign started? Well, unfortunately, the renegotiation didn't give Cameron that much credit that it had in 1975 for Harold Wilson, so it was pretty quickly ditched. Um, and you never hear, heard anything about it again. Nevertheless, it was still penciled in. It was still there if Britain had voted Remain. And to some extent, even though the renegotiation um, that Britain had secured, as soon as Britain voted to leave, the European Union made very clear this renegotiation is now gone. It's not something that we're ever going to contemplate again. It had set down some guidelines, some hints of what the European Union may be willing to negotiate in future when it comes to a new treaty change, not for the UK now, but for other member states. So, the Prime Minister comes back with this renegotiation that is quickly forgotten about. The campaign officially begins. And actually, well, what happened in the campaign? Well, several key issues to bring out about the actual campaign. First of all, cabinet and political divisions certainly suddenly became very obvious. The biggest division clearly was that by Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson, the former mayor of London, is a political heavyweight within the Conservative Party. He's very appealing, he's a bit jovial, he can be a bit of a joker, but at the same time he's seen as somebody who kind of connects to your average man or woman in the street. He's very well known. He and Cameron and Osborne um, and several other members of the senior leadership of the Conservative Party have known each other for, for years. So Boris Johnson's decision to back the Leave campaign was possibly one of the most crucial moments of the campaign early on. 
it was clear there were going to be cabinet splits. Cameron had already made clear that members of the cabinet could campaign on different sides. Therefore, disbanding the, uh, or abandoning the, the, uh, the, the convention of collective cabinet responsibility, which is that the cabinet is united on all fronts. To some extent, we already knew that people like Michael Gove um, or Ian Duncan Smith and other prominent Eurosceptics were almost certainly going to break ranks with the Prime Minister and campaign for leave. It was really Boris Johnson. Where was Boris Johnson going to go? Which side was he going to go? And there's still a lot of speculation as to why Boris did what he did. Did he back leave because, in principle, when he thought about what was best for the United Kingdom going forward, that he considered Britain leaving the European Union to be something that was in Britain's national interest in the longer run? Or did he do it because he didn't expect leave to win, but by backing leave, he could set himself up within the Conservative Party as the next Prime Minister when Cameron would eventually have to resign. So did he do it for his own political ambitions? Oops. The jury is still out on this. A lot of people think he did it for his own personal reasons, but he was still able to square that with his own Euroscepticism, which was long-standing. Modern Euroscepticism in the UK, to some extent, can be traced almost back to Boris Johnson as a young reporter in Brussels back in the, uh, in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. I think that's when he was there. And the type of Euroscepticism which was attacking the absurdities of the European Union. People in Brussels, they loved reading his column in the Telegraph. They thought he was a great journalist, but they thought it was all nonsense. But what they misunderstood was that what he was trying to do in terms of selling the European Union by highlighting some of its silliness um, was actually setting down a tone of Euroscepticism that eventually would inform a large degree of Euroscepticism in the European and then the Eurosceptic campaign later on. So Boris Johnson has been here in the Eurosceptic mold from, from the very beginning. The two campaign groups, well, on the Leave side, there were two Leave groups. There was Leave.eu and Vote Leave. Vote Leave was the official Leave campaign. Leave.eu was the kind of the UKIP. Um, Aaron Banks, Aaron Banks being a millionaire insurance um, salesman who had bankrolled UKIP for a long time, he both bankrolled, bankrolled um, Leave.eu, but Vote Leave was the official Leave campaign. It was chosen. They had to bid um, over who, to, who, who the Electoral Commission would decide to be the official front um, for the Leave campaign and therefore who would get certain mailing rights, who would get certain money and um, TV time and so forth. That course splits within the Leave side, however those splits were one, they were weakening, but at the same time they were also quite strengthening because that allowed the Leave campaign to send out a whole array of messages that weren't necessarily united and therefore played to different, um, different groups within the UK. The Remain campaign was fronted by Britain Stronger in Europe, which people pointed out can be abbreviated to BSE, which is not necessarily um, the best thing in Britain because that's mad cow disease. Nevertheless, Britain Stronger in Europe built on some of the campaigns that stretch back to the 1970s to present a pro-European campaign in the United Kingdom, but those groups have always been very weak. It didn't base itself on the Conservative Party or on the Labour Party or the Liberal Democrats, unlike in Scotland where the pro-independence campaign was built heavily on the Scottish National Party, it wasn't just the Scottish National Party, but it had been able to draw on the resources of the Scottish National Party. BSE, or Britain Stronger in Europe, had always been very weak, its leadership um, was fragmented, it wasn't brilliantly funded, and pro-European campaigns in Britain have an awful history when it comes to unity and actually effectiveness. They've always been very quiet and kind of pushed to the sides. What were the key issues for both sides? Well, Britain's stronger in Europe played on the economy. It played up the economic cost to the United Kingdom of leaving the European Union. That was, for BSE, the number one issue. Security also came into this. Um, from Britain stronger in Europe, Britain was stronger within the European Union that provided a, an overall security context, a security framework within which Britain could tackle problems such as environmental problems, policing problems and so forth. So Britain was stronger, not just in Europe, but by being in Europe it was stronger in the world thanks to its security and, e and the economic links that the UK, UK had with the EU. And the economic links were pretty obvious. I mean, when you look at the 44-45% of Britain's trade, which is with the European Union, which is Britain's largest single economic trading partner, whether it's in services, whether it's goods, and capital, and so forth, the economic case was a pretty sound one. You know, they made a very, very strong case on this. Vote Leave and Leave.eu, however, focused on immigration and sovereignty. To begin with, Leave.eu and UKIP 
for example, really did bang on about immigration, immigration, immigration. And people thought that when Vote Leave was set up and was therefore going to be separate from Leave.eu, that Vote Leave would play more on the economics, upon the global economic issues, and other issues. It wouldn't go down to the kind of the base issue of immigration. But very quickly, what actually happened was that Vote Leave realized this is actually the way that we're going to win. This is actually the way into people's hearts and minds. So they began playing on the immigration, immigration, immigration issue. It became a very prominent issue for the, um, the pro-Leave um, campaigns. Sovereignty, however, was also one of the big issues um, for the Leave campaign. The Remain campaign would argue by pooling Britain's sovereignty, we're all stronger together in Europe and stronger in the world and so forth, but that doesn't really sell very well when compared to, say, the Leave campaign's arguments that actually it should be the House of Commons that makes our laws, that it shouldn't be these unelected bureaucrats, although that's kind of a slightly strange term, unelected bureaucrat. Um, you know, bureaucrats are always unelected, but nevertheless, the people in the European Commission and these distant bureaucrats in Brussels who should be telling us what to do. So they focus on sovereignty and the right of the British people to decide what they wanted to do. So, how did Britain vote? This is what British voters were confronted with when they went into voting booth or they, they voted um, from home, they voted by post. So, vote only once. Should the United Kingdom remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union? And you had one option. Simple enough, remain or leave. Now, the following slides I didn't want to put onto the handout um, because there were quite a few of them, but um, if you want them, just email me and I'll, I'll happily share them with you. How do people vote? Well, this is the basic division in terms of geographical division. So you can see the remaining blue, Scotland, Northern Ireland, little areas of Wales, London, and some areas of the south, and Gibraltar. Gibraltar is the one area, one UK overseas territory, which was um, part of the European Union for significant reasons, such as it's attached to Spain. So it was allowed um, to vote in this. It's also part of, um, uh, part of one of the um, MEPs constituencies. I think it's the southwest. So Gibraltar was allowed to vote in this, and it voted overwhelmingly to stay in the European Union. Result overall, 48.1% 48, remain, 51.9% to leave. And as you can see, there, the yellow is mainly in England and Wales, and the blue is Scotland, Northern Ireland, and London, and some areas of, of, of the south. This contrasted with how MPs voted. What did MPs declare as their stated preference in terms of Britain leaving or remaining? Well, more, leave and MP, more MPs back remaining in the, uh, the European Union than back leaving it. As you can see, it was a bit more of a kind of a spread, although again, in Scotland, um, everybody was back <coughs> remain. Again, in London, remain overwhelming. But there was that clash. So if you go back, you see how the British people voted in terms of constituencies and then how their MPs actually voted. There was a real tension here, which we'll come back to next week when we vote about what, when we talk about what happens next. How do MPs reconcile the fact that this vote was advisory? It's not binding on Parliament. Uh, Parliament cannot be bound by anybody other than itself, essentially. Um, so therefore, what does Parliament do? Does it ignore what the British people voted for? Because Parliament, in terms of MPs, don't believe in this result, or do they follow um, what the British people voted for? Compared to 1975 to 2016, you almost had a complete reversal. In 1975, it, would, it was the English who were overwhelmingly the most pro-European in terms of remaining in the European single market, uh, European economic community, or the single market, as it might have been termed there. It was the Scots, the Northern Irish, and to a lesser extent London, who were more of the Eurosceptic. Um, in fact, the only area that voted leave back in 1975 were places like Orkney and Shetland um, and some of the islands of Scotland. Fast forward to 2016 and it almost kind of completely reversed. It was the English who were now the overwhelming Eurosceptics and uneasy at remaining within the European Union. And the Scots, really the Scottish result hadn't changed that much. In 1975, 58% of Scots, I think, voted to remain in the European Economic Community. That was low compared, I think, to about 67% overall in the UK. In 2016, in Scotland, it was about 62% voted remain. So, you know, we've gone from 58 to 62%. So back in the 70s, the Scots were considered the Eurosceptics, 58% of them voting remain, whereas now they're considered the pro-Europeans because only 62% of them voted um, to, to, to remain. So it tells you how dire the pro-European position is in the UK that Scotland is now appointed to as a pro-European part, even though that vote hasn't changed that much. Nevertheless, real change um, in terms of how the British people voted here. You can probably see it a bit more clearer here in terms of degree 
um, in terms of the remaining share of the vote. So um, 75, the kind of the green areas, the greener it gets, the more pro-European or pro-Remain, I should say, the vote was. So again, you can see this big focus of green down here and then up here in Scotland. And then the dark blue are the strong leave areas, especially down here um, along the east coast of, 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 of England. Now, this map doesn't necessarily convey the, uh, the, 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 the vote in terms of population. And again, the London thing down here, I don't think you should underestimate this because when you put a map up that measures things by population, you suddenly see, in terms of Remain and Leave, there's Scotland in terms of Remain, and there's, there's London in terms of Remain, and there's the rest of the UK in terms of England and Wales and Northern Ireland over there as well. So you can see that real contrast between Scotland and London and the rest of the United Kingdom. So there are clear geographical divisions in how the British people vote. By demographic, um, men and women, they voted the same, pretty much aligned with the overall result, 52-48. There was no difference between men and women in how they voted. Age groups, however, 18 to 24 year olds, 73% voted. According to Ashcroft polling, Lord Ashcroft is uh, a conservative peer who is one of Britain's most prominent pollsters now. Um, he carried out these polling, polling data after the referendum, so it's one of the best strides that we have about how British people voted. 18 to 24 year olds, 73% of them voted Remain, as opposed to 27%. You can see, as you get older, down to 55 to 64 and 65% uh, and older, it's down to 40 to 43% in terms of Remain, and suddenly the Eurosceptic vote gets older um, as you go by. There is some speculation that if the vote had been held in maybe 10 years' time, enough of these older generations would have died um, to actually have changed the result. In fact, um, John Curtis, one of Britain's leading cephologists, joked about a week before the referendum had happened that if the result came down to maybe, I don't know, a couple of tens of thousands of votes, then technically dead people could have swung the vote because by the time um, these people, because uh, older people would probably usually vote by post, um, and by the time the vote comes around, enough of them who voted by post to leave probably could have died, um, and therefore the result could have been gone a different way because of dead people. You know, it could have been that close, but partly because of elderly people. Nevertheless, the general trend, of course, is young people voted in, older people voted out. In terms of social groupings, A, B, they are professionals, C, 1, kind of semi-professional, C, 2, skilled laborers, D, E, um, kind of unskilled, unemployed, and so forth. You can see how, um, if you're a professional, educated, if you're an academic, for example, management position, doctors, so forth, 57% vote remain, and then further down you go with the kind of the, the class system in terms of employment, in terms of skills, the closer you see, the, the stronger you see the, the, the lead vote. You can also see this in terms of cities. This is a map produced by, I think it was the Centre for Cities a few weeks ago, that looks at GVA, gross value added per worker in the UK, and it maps British towns and cities and compares them with other European towns and cities in terms of how productive British workers are in these towns and cities in terms of GVA, in terms of productivity, in terms of patents and so forth. And going back to that geographical map earlier of where leave voters tended to be, here we are in the north of England, outside London, this block, blip, blip, these blips of green. You see these kind of, you know, kind of orange areas, so very low GVA, almost as low as large areas of Eastern Europe. When you think about large areas of England, outside London and the southeast, they tend to be very unproductive um, or low productivity. They tend to be very cheap. They don't tend to be very dynamic. Actually, they have more in common with some areas of Eastern Europe in terms of um, their lifestyle, or their lifestyle, their, their kind of their economic outlook on the future. Again, if you look at educational background, university graduates, overwhelmingly, if you have a de had a degree, you voted remain. A-levels, I mean, this is your basic um, education breakdown in the UK. GCSE or lower is 16 years. Um, the exams you take at, G at 16, your general certificate of secondary education. If you only have GCSEs or left school at 16 and 17, overwhelmingly, you voted leave. A-levels are what you take at 18, so again, a bit more of a split, but again, generally, if you have more qualifications, the more likely you were to vote Remain. You can see it in the newspapers. If you read the Express, the Mail, the Sun, and the Telegraph, you voted Leave. Times and the Guardian, and I think there you also include the FT or the Economist, 
um, you voted ten, you, you tended to vote Remain. So there's a clear split in terms of the papers. The Times tended to head its bets. I think it was the Times, was it the Sunday Times that backed Remain, whereas the Times in the week backed Leave and so forth. You can see it in the political parties in terms of how they voted. Um, so here we've got the Conservative Party, about 58% of Conservative voters voted Leave as opposed to 42%. So you can see how Cameron lost his own party on this one. Um, in terms of the Labour Party, 37% voted Leave as well. 63-70% um, for the Liberal Democrats, they were the more pro-European. 4% of UKIP voters voted Remain. I mean, you know, make of that what you will. Um, you are those 4%. Uh, but nevertheless, they're there. Um, and remember, UKIP was a protest vote, so they could be the 4% that voted UKIP out of protest on other matters. Green Party, again, 75% overwhelmingly in favour, and the Scottish Nationalists, 64% in favour um, of remaining as opposed to 36% leaving. But notice this figure here for a moment, because one of the issues that's raised, I'll come back to this later, was that Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party, didn't go out and campaign, so the Labour Party wasn't really as effective as it should have been in, in, in reaching out to... Um, to, to, to its supporters to get them to vote Remain. But hang on, it's almost the same as the SNP, where Nicola Sturgeon and the Scottish Nationalists were pretty clear in terms of what, they were, what their position was about Britain voting Remain or Leave, and they were very much in favour of Britain remaining in the European Union. They didn't want to see Scotland dragged out of it. You can see it in terms of identity. So again, Remain is in yellow. If you identify yourself as English, not British, then 79% of people who identify themselves that way voted Leave. There's a very strong connection between Euroscepticism and Leave voters and English identity. If you identify yourself as more British, then you tend to vote Remain. That's a real tension in British politics that British and especially English politicians are very uncomfortable <coughs> about facing at the moment, especially within the Labour Party. English nationalism is still seen as something of football hooliganism, um, something very crude rather than um, something more sophisticated like it might be in Scotland. British nationalism, British identity tends to be seen as more outward looking and so forth, and especially connected to London. So, I think this is on your handout. Your average Leave voter, they tended to leave school before they were 17. They have no real advanced academic qualifications. They tend to be older. They work in less secure, lower income jobs, and they identify themselves strongly as English. The main voters are younger, better educated, more financially secure, identify themselves as British or Londoner, for example, and they tend to be more empowered. They feel like the future is more optimistic. This is one of the division. Leave voters tend to be more pessimistic. They tend to think their children's um, uh, fortunes are going to be far worse than theirs, whereas Remain voters were more optimistic about what would happen to their children. So Leave voters, if you can break it down into what they were voting against, they were dissatisfied with how the EU was working. We shouldn't overlook this. Um, but it was certainly strong concerns about immigration and its effects on Britain's economy, on Britain's welfare state and its culture. Uh, don't overlook this because if you go back to, um, say, something like this, some of these areas which had large leave votes, you don't actually have that many immigrants in because they're very economically deprived. Immigrants don't want to go to these areas. So in some of these areas, there was an imagined influx, to some extent, of immigrants. However, in other areas, which had never seen huge influx of immigrants, there was an immediate reaction to this. Areas like London and Manchester and so forth, they had their cities, they have a long tradition of welcoming in new groups and, and, and assimilating these groups. Whereas the large areas of, uh, of England, which saw a huge increase in immigration, didn't have that, um, that experience and therefore tended to vote Leave. So, why did Leave win? Um, here we can look to Charles Grant, uh, who's a very pro-European head of the Centre for European Reform, a think tank in London, and he breaks it down into what he calls the five M's. First, messengers. The Leave campaign had the more effective messengers. They had Boris Johnson. Uh, they had people who formed, who could be said to be almost a government in waiting. As the campaign drew on, the way that the, the Leave campaign was presenting itself, especially Vote Leave, the official Leave campaign, about committing money to the NHS, about um, identifying certain things that they want Britain to secure in the world later on, they became almost a government in waiting. So the messenger was a bit more credible. When people compare, for example, Trump and Brexit, I think they overlooked that Trump's, Trump's equal in the UK is probably Nigel Farage. Farage on his own was not going to win that campaign. 
If Farage had been the front to the Leave campaign, they almost certainly would have lost. In fact, there are some in the, the Leave campaign, on the official Leave campaign and Vote Leave, who think Farage actually probably cost them votes. Because there have been studies that show the more people saw Farage, the more Remain voters tended to come out and actually vote Remain. So perhaps, actually, Farage being overshadowed by these giants like Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, for example, meant that his kind of, the toxicity that sometimes he brought to this campaign was toned down. Nevertheless, at the same time, he also delivered a huge chunk of voters who tend to be very angry with the elite and who tended to see through Boris Johnson and think of Boris Johnson as this very rich, Eton, Oxford-educated um, snob. The messengers on the Remain side were pretty weak and ineffective. David Cameron became, as the campaign wore on, his credibility was worn down. His own handling of the Panama Papers, in which it was revealed that his father, his late father, had taken advantage of, you know, of, of, of tax havens to some extent in a legal way, it should be said, nevertheless did him damage early on. George Osborne, the Chancellor, had overdone it in terms of threatening and warning about the possible implications for Britain um, leaving the European Union. They were associated with the status quo in terms of austerity, so it was a case of you know, voting against David Cameron and George Osborne would be a good thing if you wanted to get rid of this Conservative government as it was structured, even if you were still going to get Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and others like that. Nevertheless, when it came to messengers, the Leave campaign tended to have the more effective uh, people. You also have to, as I said, think about Jeremy Corbyn. On the Labour side, he was pretty invisible because he's quietly a Eurosceptic from the left. He wasn't, didn't want to appear to be supporting David Cameron, certainly. Um, and that, that meant that other, other Remain leaders, such as Nicola Sturgeon, um, Tim Farron, for example, from the Liberal Democrats, they were never going to be enough to, to equal the likes of uh, Boris Johnson and so forth. The message... Well, the Remain campaign um, focused on the economics, it focused on numbers, it focused on very dry statistics, which, yes, people understood, people certainly heard, but they didn't necessarily believe it because it was over the top sometimes in terms of talking about real fear-mongering sometimes from the Remain campaign. The Leave campaign was a bit more um, optimistic. It was also able to play to more hearts and minds messages in terms of about immigration, and community, and culture, and identity, things that people understood more easily. And the pollsters have pointed out for some time that if you look back over about the, uh, about the last two, three years before the referendum, usually in opinion polling, when people are asked, what is the biggest concern for you politically, they will identify the economy, and then they might say the health service, or crime, and then maybe Europe comes further down, further down the list. As we got closer to the referendum, the pollsters noted that the economy, which is what the Remain campaign went on in terms of its message, was eclipsed by immigration. Immigration was just ahead as a number one concern for more Britons. So when the, Remain, the Leave campaign went on the migration issue and the immigration issue, it was connecting to a larger number of people than the Remain campaign would by focusing on economics. Which brings me on to the third thing in terms of migration. As I said, the Vote Leave campaign shifted over to this pretty quick. It threw out some pretty bogus figures about what would happen if Britain remained in the European Union in terms of Turkey's membership and so forth. Figures which the British government wasn't in a position to contradict because of ongoing very sensitive negotiations between the UK, the EU and Turkey over what was happening in the Middle East and so forth. So the Leave campaign was able to get away with issues about migration in a far more easier way than it probably should have been able to do so. Um, and the Labour Party itself was deeply split on the issue of migration. A large number of Labour MPs did not want to go out and campaign in their constituencies, which tended to be, to be predominantly working class, poor constituencies across the UK, knock on doors and suddenly face voters who were going to bite their heads off about migration. To some extent, this was because Labour MPs had never had to do this. They'd never had to confront their, can, uh, their constituencies on the issue of immigration, and they didn't want to do it now in such a short time frame. Labour have been wrestling with this for about, well, for about 10 years, has become more sceptical skeptical about immigration than it was in the past, but it's very quiet about this. It doesn't really want to shout about it, partly because the Labour Party is split um, between a very London-centred Labour Party, which tends to be very cosmopolitan, pro-immigration and so forth, and the Labour Party that finds itself facing voters in the north of England who tend to be far more sceptical about migration. The media... Um, it's hardly surprising that the media in Britain tended to be very Eurosceptic in attacking 
um, David Cameron's renegotiation, it doesn't come as a surprise that overwhelmingly the print media campaigned for Britain to leave. Because if you look back at the print media or the British media in general over the last 40 years in its attitude to European integration or to the European Union and Britain's membership, you see that you can divide its opinion into three blocks. Most coverage of European Union matters in the British media tends to be neutral. It tends to be factual, like most media is, reporting what's happened, what's going on, and what debate is happening, and what meeting is happening, and so forth. So the vast majority is neutral. Okay. But a very large chunk of the media's coverage, especially in the press, tends to be Eurosceptic, and attacking the European Union, lashing out at it, accusing it of things that it's not guilty of, and so forth, questioning Britain's membership, and so forth. And that in itself is not unhealthy. Of course, you should have a media that questions Britain's member, but membership of the European Union, um, questions the European Union, raises silly things about the European Union. That in itself is not wrong. Unfortunately, when you look at the balance and you look for the pro-European or the case that's actually made in the British press for the European Union, it tends to have been tiny. So it's never been balanced when you look at media coverage uh, by an equal degree of coverage that's pro-European. So it was not surprising that the media tended to come out against um, the, the, the renegotiation and Britain's continued membership of the European Union. When it came to the BBC and the TV media, the BBC played it neutral in an almost ridiculous way. Um, whatever the issue was, they had to have somebody presenting both sides of the view and they were given equal, equal billing, even if it was clear that one side was wrong. Um, they still had to give the other side um, of, of, of the debate an equal billing. Therefore, both sides got a got equal airing and therefore people would give in the impression that both sides were equally right about what they were arguing about. The BBC did this because of fear about its own future and its own position um, if the Conservative Party, uh, the Conservative government reviewing the future of the BBC, they were worried that this would endanger the future of the BBC if they were seen to be too pro-Remain. And when it came to online media, the Leave campaign won hands down. Not surprising if you look at insurgent parties, populist parties, that have developed over the last 20, 30 years, they tend to have been far more adept at using online media um, than traditional political parties have been. And then when it came down to the machines, as I said earlier, the two campaigns, they were both pretty dysfunctional. They were both pretty inept. But nevertheless, the machine that the Leave campaign was able to mobilize was far more effective, in part because some of the people who led that campaign had led the campaign against an electoral, in an electoral reform referendum that had taken place in 2011, in which they honed their kind of their skills in, in highlighting or being able to get across to the British people that actually you should be voting about something else. So I remember back in 2011 when there was the referendum on AV, the alternative vote um, system, and moving Britain's first past the post system to an AV system. The anti AV campaign that was run by some of the same people who ran Vote Leave focused on why do we need a new electoral system? We need to spend money on the NHS. Why are we spending money on a new electoral system? We should be spending money on schools. And this was almost what they came down to when it came to this campaign. They moved it away from an issue about Europe to issues about people's um, local communities, about the future of the National Health Service, which caught the pollsters unaware. They weren't expecting the NHS to be such a big issue in this campaign, but it did become this because it was about solidarity. It was about austerity. It became, issues, became about issues other than the European Union. I'll skip over that one for the moment and just go on to what the immediate implications were. Well... As you can all, as you all appreciate, the immediate implications of the defeat was that David Cameron resigned immediately. Some people had speculated that he would stay on to provide some unity in the Conservative Party, but no, he resigned almost immediately. But he wasn't the only one. Nigel Farage resigned as leader of the UK Independence Party. He considered his job done, and therefore he stepped down. Um, the UK Independence Party therefore elected a new leader, um, Diane James, I think her name was, who lasted 18 days and then resigned. Um, and then new leadership race took over. And if any of you know what happened, um, some of the, um, well, one of the candidates got into a fight um, on the left is Mike Hookham, brilliantly named um, UK member of the European Parliament, former soldier, who got into an altercation, let's call it that, with Stephen Wolfe, who was possibly one of the leadership um, candidates for UKIP and it was threatening to defect to the Conservative Party, and as you can see, that altercation did not end well. Um, therefore, Nigel Farage came back as interim leader, and I think, I can't remember if one of the bookies has done this, one of the betting markets has done this, but 
um, as a joke, I think one of them said, we're now going to start a betting market on when Nigel Farage next comes back as interim leader of the UK Independence Party, because he's resigned before, come back, resigned before, come back, resign and come back. So when's he going to resign and come back again? So UKIP is in a bit of disarray. What's the future of UKIP now? But it's not just UKIP and the Conservative Party. The Labour Party immediately started a leadership race because Jeremy Corbyn's apathy when it came to the referendum campaign didn't go down well with large net numbers of his MPs who can't stand him anyway. So this brought into the open a leadership challenge. Corbyn won, um, it must be said, but nevertheless, the Labour Party's immediately kind of went into this debate about what to do about itself um, following the referendum. The Liberal Democrats have seen an opening, um, having been decimated at the 2015 election. Tim Fallon here has seen an opportunity to come back, um, and they did very well when David Cameron recently resigned as an MP and stepped down. His, count, his constituency of Whitney um, came up for election, and the Liberal Democrats came back in quite a big way. They didn't win it. It would have been an incredible achievement to win it, but nevertheless, um, there's still a pulse in the Liberal Democrats' um, body. Nicola Sturgeon, well, she's got some thinking to do. Yes, she sees an opportunity here for a second referendum on Scottish independence, but be under no illusions, the complications now for Scotland leaving the UK while the UK leaves the EU makes Scottish independence a real nightmare scenario. So she's taking this very carefully. She sees opportunities, but there are distinct dangers for her as well. And of course, within the Conservative Party, there was a leadership race in which everybody stabbed each other in the back, and... Well, as you can see from the shoe, Theresa May emerged as Prime Minister pretty quick, um, was appointed by the Queen without really doing anything really to campaign. I mean, it was almost a coronation, uh, thanks to all the other leaders really fighting each other and kind of stabbing each other in the back. Boris Johnson was stabbed in the back by Michael Gove, who backed him in terms of um, the two of them had been instrumental in getting Britain out of the European Union, which leads to some speculation that they didn't expect to win this. And if you look at some of the, the images of them the day after, um, the vote had taken place. They look a bit shocked at kind of like, oh God, have we actually got to deliver on this? Um, others say that they were just being very sober about this. But nevertheless, Theresa May becomes Prime Minister. But what does she do? Well, much to the shock of everybody else, as Private I summed it up, Queen asking, how low can you go? And Theresa May <laughs> saying, I've appointed Boris as Foreign Secretary. Came as a real shock. You know, Boris is back. Uh, and so were some of the most pro-Brexit MPs and leaders of the Leave campaign, such as David Davis, um, who we'll hear more about next week, and Liam Fox, who had to resign a few years earlier because of um, allegations of corruptions to some extent. So they were back. But why has she done this? We'll come on to next week. Questions we're going to discuss very briefly, if you want to, um, in a moment, are why do you think the British people voted to leave the EU, not just based on what you've heard today, but also in terms of what you've heard um, debated in the media, online and elsewhere. Did David Cameron have a strategy for dealing adequately with Britain's European question? How do you define that European question? What was his strategy for dealing with the European question within the Conservative Party? And one question which has started to emerge has, uh, is the question, would Britain still be in the EU, EU if an earlier referendum had been being called on another EU matter? If the British people had been given a vote on the Lisbon Treaty or the Euro and being able to say no to that, would that have let off steam in the British political system, have vented frustrations and allowed Britain to actually manage its relationship with the, British, uh, with the European Union better? <coughs> By putting it in an all or, all or nothing, in-out referendum, did we eventually put ourselves in a very dangerous position whereby frustrations about a whole host of things came down to in or out when it should have actually been about a lesser issue such as membership of the Euro and so forth? How did we find ourselves in the position of having an in-out referendum when actually it could have possibly been on another matter entirely? And we're going to discuss that now.